Let's go eat some fried fish, fried fish. Cause there's no more pasta, oh no. We're gonna eat some fried fish, fried fish. Tonight, closed all the bars and all the restaurants. That's designed to stop the spread of the, vir the virus. My goal is to make sure that all those people who are working at a restaurant in Myrtle Beach and were working in a, a bar all over South Carolina, that their income is protected. We don't need a Christmas tree approach. We need to protect people who have lost their jobs because of the virus, no more, no less. Okay, okay. all of that, are we gonna get that because it didn't start out too well in the house? Well, the House bill is going to pass the Senate tomorrow afternoon, and that deals with people who are sick. What's happened now is that people in South Carolina and throughout the country are out of work because of the virus. The economy three weeks ago was historically good. Along comes the virus. This president closed down travel between us and China, the single best decision he made. Now, he told me tonight that those people are out of work because of the containment policies shutting down restaurants, hotels, and bars, we're going to keep their checks coming. They don't need $1,000. They need a sustainable income, either through loans from their employers to keep the payroll coming or get on unemployment insurance or something like it so they'll have income. Our number one job right now is to provide income to those people who have lost their job. I was just at Market Basket, minding my own business by myself, getting some water an American guy white guy comes up to me he's like this is your fault you fucking chicks this message is for Brian Chesky of Airbnb we are your loyal hosts and most devoted supporters well that is we used to be now with fire boiling through our veins we are collectively outraged we thought you cared until you stabbed us in the back and left us to die. You give us the illusion of stability, then you tear it from our bleeding hands when we need it most. You let us choose a cancellation policy, then you override it on your whim like a sadistic tyrant. Maybe you're good at big numbers, engineering the perfect algorithm, designing the perfect culture, building systems at gravity-defying scale, but you greedy, selfish, arrogant, flippant, wishy-washy, backstabbing bastard, you would not have an empire without us. It's our homes on your platform. It's our face on millions of listings. It's our soul that brings the magic. It's our thoughtful touches they love. It's our coffee they drink each morning. It's our place that makes you money. You may have started this company, but we helped you build it. As you sit in your fancy office dreaming up your next billion, we are the legion that make it possible. We are the fuel that powers your machine. We are the ones standing in line for five hours to buy toilet paper so what few guests we have left can clean their ass before they cancel penalty free. You are nothing without us. We are not numbers. We are not data. We are people bleeding out with your evil, unethical, and immoral extenuation. You keep calling this the Chinese virus. There are reports of dozens of incidents of bi bias against Chinese Americans in this country. Your own aide, Secretary Azar, says he does not use this term. He says ethnicity does not cause the virus. Why do you keep using this? Because it comes from it's China. Racist. It's not racist at all, no, not at all. It comes from China, that's why comes from China. I and want to be accurate. Yeah, please, John. Please. You. Um, you I have the great, China? I have great love uh, for all of the people from our country. But uh, as you know, China tried to say at one point, maybe this stuff now, that it was caused by American soldiers. That can't happen. It's not going to happen. Not as long as I'm president. That's the thing about COVID-19. It doesn't care about how rich you are, how famous you are, how funny you are, how smart you are, where you live, how old you are, what amazing stories you can tell. 
it's the great equalizer. And what's terrible about it is what's great about it. What's terrible about it is it's made us all equal in many ways. And what's wonderful about it is that it's made us all equal in many ways. <laughs> like I used to say at the end of human nature, I mean, like, we're all in the same boat. And if the ship goes down, we're all going down. You have no G20 in the file? You're interfering with me. Just my Sir, I'm just, I, I represent him. Yeah, she's she's a major radio thing. She's 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 and a warrant for your arrest and being a lawful president. Where's, yeah. Where's the warrant? Speak English? Yeah. Where's the warrant? I have a copy of it in my car. No, that's not acceptable. Sir, that, that is acceptable. not acceptable in the court. You must Sir. show him a warrant hey, hey, for your arrest, sir. I have the right to do this. No, you do not. Oh, you do not have a warrantless arrest? The ICE agent was just lying and using that as a uh, reason to not have to give me the warrant. And the reason was because he didn't have a warrant. When I arrived uh, at the courthouse and at the courtroom, uh, I saw uh, a detective uh, standing outside the courtroom. Uh, and uh, an individual dressed in a t-shirt uh, and it was immediately apparent to me that he was an undercover um, ICE agent. Uh, I approached them, uh, I asked them what they were there for, uh, they wouldn't tell me, uh, but they were standing outside the courtroom of our judge and it was the only case that the judge had scheduled at that time so I knew that the only reason they would be there was for my client. Uh, I pressed again and asked what they were there for and they wouldn't tell me and then finally I just asked them if they were there for Franklin, at which point the ICE agent confirmed that he was. I asked him to see a copy of the warrant and he said that he uh, could not give it to me because I did not have the proper paperwork on file for uh, Franklin. What he was referring to was the entry of appearance in an immigration case. The problem was no one had his, their appearance entered for Franklin because there was no immigration case pending. He had never been in immigration court. There was no detainer against him. There was no warrant for his arrest. The ICE agent was just lying and using that as a uh, reason to not have to give me the warrant. And the reason was because he didn't have a warrant. We are asking for help from the public um, to spread the Franklin's story, um, to create the public pressure to get uh, Franklin help uh, to get this case resolved in a way that gets Franklin released uh, from detention and hopefully uh, gets his criminal case uh, dismissed or gets him placed into ARD. Where's the warrant? I have a copy of it in my car. No, that's not acceptable. Sir, that is, that acceptable. is not acceptable sir. in the court. You must sir. show him sir. a warrant hey, 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 for your hey, arrest, hey, 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 sir. Hey, 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 I have the right to arrest. No, you do not. Arrest. Oh, you do not. Listen, arrest. Local organizations supporting the measure include the International League of People's Struggle, Migrante Portland, PCHIRP, All African People's Re Revolutionary Party, FRSO, and Red Rainbow PDX. An eviction moratorium is good in that it will keep people in their homes during the peak of the pandemic. But if they're thrown out right after, or three months, or six months after, they will still be in danger, and the economy of Portland will still limp along as it attempts to recover from the virus. Thank you. Flatten the curve! Freeze. Freeze the rents. Flatten the curb. Freeze the rents. Flatten the curb. Freeze the rents. You will not pay rent on April 1st. You will not pay rent. You will not pay rent to collect it. Thank you. If we can. 18,000 people in county signing it, you will not get the people to sign it. Thank you. Thank you. Can we open? No, it is not. But you need to be held to account. Thank you. Can we just let. You need to be held to account. Don't tell me to thank you. You, you need to no. go outside. If you no, I don't need to do anything. I should just come to you and cough on you. What are you going to do about that? Can really? we can yeah. we say that in front of the entire media? Yeah. yeah. Can we can we um, give the press a chance to ask Dr. Vine's help? questions? Let them and ask. Chair Kafori, do you want to continue? Uh, we're going to continue. Is there any more questions in this? And I'm asking people to think broadly about strategies that can help us uh, ride the wave of the economic impact that's being created by this public health crisis. Well, we're not the best in I, I, I need you to let other people ask questions. You got your time no, at the no, mic. No, no. Yes, no. yes, yes. What about the other questions? Sure. I'm sorry. Imagine there's no heaven. It's easy.
easy if you try. No hell below us. Above us on the sky. Imagine all the people. Living for today. Yeah. Imagine there is no countries yet. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for. And no religion too. Imagine all the people living for today. Oh. You may say that I'm a dreamer. But I'm not the only one. I hope someday you will join us. And the world will live as one. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed and hunger. Brotherhood of man. Sharing all the world, you. They may say that I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us, and the world will be as one. Let's hope all those things come with a time machine, too, to turn back the clock on these last three months that have been wasted while the White House was saying this was a hope. You know, my message is that um, let's get back to work. Let's get back to living. Let's be smart about it. Uh, and those of us who are 70 plus, we'll, we'll take care of ourselves, but don't sacrifice the country. Don't do that. Don't ruin so this great American So you're basically dream. saying that this disease could take your life, but that's not the scariest thing to you. There's something that would be worse than dying. I think uh, as time goes forward, hopefully doctors and scientists will get a better hmm. better handle on, on the whole situation. Fortunately, from what I understand, you know, <clears throat> it is contagious, but the death rate is, is pretty low. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, I understand the fear. Yeah. yeah. Well, we can see you still have a cough. What do the doctors say about your own condition moving forward as we wrap this up? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Let me get some of that. <laughs> they said, um, yeah, I'm fine. Uh, I got tested twice, uh, negative both times. Uh, the cough, probably just uh, nerves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, Twitter world, yours truly. Well, I'm at my local market today because I was watching a show today and, you know, everything is uh, coronavirus and they were talking about what items had uh, gone up the most, had sold the most. Uh, and, uh, you know, things like Clorox and wipes and uh, uh, TP. But the item that they say had gone up in sales the most was something called oat milk. <laughs> Something I had never heard of. I mean, I've never heard of this stuff. But evidently, it has a long shelf life. You don't have to refrigerate it until you open it. Then it has a five to seven day life like regular milk. So I decided uh, I better get it. They say it's great for protein drinks. I have protein drink every morning. Uh, in any event, I saw an in interesting reaction from a couple of my buddies yesterday. One is in the medical business, and he's been real concerned. But I've never seen this guy get pissed off until yesterday when he found out that the Las Vegas Golden Knights had postponed their games and he went through the roof. You know, now don't get me wrong, he knows it's the right thing to do, but that really pissed him off. And I kind of dogged him about it, saying, man, you don't get mad until they cancel a, a, a sporting event? That was until this morning when I saw they postponed the Masters Golf Tournament. I got to admit, <laughs> I was pissed off. You know, it seems like in times like this, we need those distractions. But I'm a father. I have four kids, so I know it's the right thing to do. Uh, I'm just glad that football is five, six months away. Hopefully this thing will be under control by then. I'm just saying, take care.
You know, since the beginning of the COVID-19 outbreak, we have seen not only the spreading of the virus, but also a rapid spreading of racism and xenophobia. Uh, we have witnessed at the highest levels, in fact, of the Republican Party fanning irresponsibly uh, these flames. Um, one colleague tweeted that everything you need to know about the Chinese coronavirus, unquote. Uh, my district is home to nearly 32 percent foreign-born residents, with more than a quarter immigrating from Asia. This painful rhetoric has consequences. Uh, restaurants across Boston's Chinatown have seen up to an 80 percent drop in business. And I believe this has everything to do with the rapid spread of misinformation and paranoia. It is critical that we stand against these insightful messages and assuage fear in our communities. And we do that by dispelling untruths and misinformation. Uh, we can only do that by sharing. The Coronavirus is not an excuse for racism. Nothing is. Discrimination can be disguised as jokes or political opinion. Don't let that happen. Be open and listen to people who have experienced racism. This can build understanding and support. It's vital to speak out when it feels safe. Call it out. Mind your language. Words can obscure people's humanity and feel stereotypes. Say what you're for. We're for a world where we can live freely and without fear. It's up to us to make that happen. Benissimo, grazie. grazie. Prima, Thank you. Today, the greatest risk of global catastrophe doesn't look like this. Instead, it looks like this. If anything kills over 10 million people in the next few decades, it's most likely to be a highly infectious virus rather than a war. Not. We do anticipate a rise in domestic violence incidents during this time. In a time when companies are encouraging their employees to work remotely and the CDC is encouraging social distancing, an abuser may take advantage of an already stressful situation to gain more control. Being cooped up in the home and disconnected from friends and colleagues places tremendous strain on victims who may face additional threats of abuse. And without the income to pay rent and because so many shelters are full, survivors have reported that they may face homelessness.
Well, COVID-19 will reduce options to seek safety for domestic violence survivors because there are fewer services and interventions available. Courts may not be processing all cases. Doctors may not have time to make referrals. With closures in the service industry sector and other employment challenges, victims may lose their jobs or be unable to find work. Individuals may feel like they have to stay with an abuser because their financial options may have become even more constrained. So the issue is that perpetrators may act with impunity, increasing their abusive behavior because they think victims cannot leave. Domestic violence and sexual assault programs are already unable to meet many needs of victims and survivors. There are thousands of requests that uh, for services that are unmet every day and COVID-19 is only making it worse. So. During economic crises, when the demand for services increased substantially, donations decreased, leaving programs in a really tough bind. And many shelters just don't have the resources. So right now, we know that funding is urgently needed. While this pandemic may present novel and significant concerns, the resilience of survivors and our work to end domestic violence in the face of overwhelming challenges is not new. We really want survivors to know that they are not alone and help is available. Many shelters are putting survivors up in hotels. Local domestic violence programs can help them plan to stay safer in their own homes or help them get to a safe place. Since it might be hard to find the privacy to make a phone call, they can reach out by chat and email. And in particular, they can contact the National Domestic Violence Hotline and they can help survivors make plans, connect with services and get support. but they wouldn't accept that language. But it doesn't make sense, does it? So anyway, we want to improve on that and improve uh, how many other people would uh, would avail themselves of it. So again, it's a, it's, these are needs that people have. This is not, this is all, understand this about this. It's really important to know this. This is all about the coronavirus. It's not about anything else. It's about the coronavirus. So this is temporary for this period of time. And and it's important to know that because people say, well, why should we do it? Because of the coronavirus. It's a public health issue, and we have to keep people as healthy as we can, and, and family medical leave is one way to do that. And then some of the other issues that I meant, that what they're getting tested, then they should have not to pay a high copay for the other services that go with that, go with that test at this time. When we're talking about... Um, the, uh, of course, the, the direct payments are directly related. Officially got laid off from my job due to the f coronavirus. When I got the news, I was shocked, but um, it was also inevitable. I work in the event industry, so we could no longer host events. Though it didn't feel real until, you know, it was real. I'm the sole provider of my family of three living in Arizona. I work in Nevada, which means my place of employment was shut down on March 17th at the government's proposal. I was laid off of two jobs because of COVID-19. I really have no idea where my next paycheck might come from, how I'm going to afford rent. While those who are already financially secure may just be adjusting to living on limited resources, those of us who are already financially insecure are nothing short of terrified. We are at risk of losing our houses, cars, um, basic necessities. Now we are closed for the foreseeable future because we put our whole life's work into making this shop, put a lot of money, put a lot of our income into making this shop. And now none of us have any kind of income coming in. We are struggling to kind of get by and support ourselves and our rent and our utilities during this time. Uh, the best message I could possibly spread right now is 
um, to be kind to one another and to support each other in literally any way that you can, whether that's cooking a meal for somebody, watching someone's kids, lending a couple dollars, letting someone vent to you about you know their life and their circumstances, that will all truly go the extra mile and know that we're going through an extremely sensitive and fragile period of our lives, but we are all going through it together. We will get through it together. You know, how is COVID-19 uh, different from the flu in terms of, you know, how it you know, interacts with the body and just how it spreads? Well, it's similar in some respects, Steph, in that it's a respiratory illness that's transmitted by the respiratory route. Uh, it gives a, 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 a degree of pathology that's mostly pneumonia. Um, the reason it's different is that it's very, very much more transmissible than flu. And more importantly, it's significantly more serious. Let me give you some very quick numbers. Okay. The overall mortality of seasonal flu that you and I confront every year is about 0.1%. The overall mortality of coronavirus is about 1%. Sometimes, like in China, it was up to 2 to 3%, which means it's at least 10 times more serious than the typical influenza. So when people kind of compare it, in some respects, it has some similarities, but it's really, really... Let us not forget that COVID-19 is a gendered crisis. Mm -hmm. Nurses, nurse aides, teachers, child carers, and early childhood educators, aged care workers, and cleaners are mostly women. They are on the front line of this public health crisis and carry a disproportionate risk of being exposed to the virus. Let's also not forget that not all homes are safe places. Quarantine or self-isolation at home will put women and children at risk. Women's advocates and domestic violence experts are warning us that domestic abuse increases during times of crisis. And I'm terribly worried that these warnings have not been heeded by this government that has long resisted adequate funding. I uh, sincerely hope that we are not at a place as Americans to where we are going to let the Democrats jam down the Green New Deal because we're at home panicked. Uh, I want to have a frank conversation with you and, and ask you where you stand. I, I mean, I'm in the danger zone. Uh, I'm right at the edge. I'm 56. In Italy, they're saying if you're sick and you're 60, don't even come in. So... I'm in the danger zone. I would rather have my children stay home and all of us who are over 50 go in and keep this economy going and working. Even if we all get sick, I'd rather die than kill the country because it's not the economy that's dying. It's the country. And I'll show you just what's happening to us just by looking at the talks with the stimulus right now. Things are really starting to heat up around here. When the virus starts hitting the people you know and love and affecting friends, and it's no longer a statistic. I watched the last rose petals go down the drain. And yes, I'm lucky I have a friend who is a florist, but even she has given me the last of her roses. As I watch them stop up the drain, and I listen to Brian Eno's new record called Rose Quartz, I thought to myself, life is so precious. Hmm. Let's be modest. For once in my life. You know, the patriarchy is still trying to ruin my life. Death to the patriarchy. Good night, Charlie Parker, and good night. It's a weird thing that goes on in society. It's very, very common, very predictable, but I want you to be fully aware of it. So when ignorance and incompetence and moral, financial and political corruption have led to a crisis, when that crisis is upon the world, every intergalactic jerkwad 
who contributed to that crisis says, hey man, now you see is not the time to point fingers. Now we've got to just deal with this, we've got to pull together, we've got to deal with this crisis. And I say, no, no, a thousand times no. Now is exactly the time to point fingers. So the elites for the past couple of decades have been telling us that the gravest danger, the gravest conceivable danger that we face as a species is not a totalitarian communist regime in China or other things. They've been telling us, you see, that the gravest danger we face as a species is a tiny change in temperatures a hundred years from now and that we need to expend every conceivable resource we have in our possession to combat a slight variation in the temperature of the planet. They got everything wrong. They said, hey, let's move all of our manufacturing to a communist dictatorship in China. Let's have free trade with them. Let's work with them. They're great guys. As it turns out, they're really not great guys and that the issue of a temperature rise could actually help against coronavirus and it is not going to be the end of everything. See, if you're not loved when you're a child, you grew up with a great yearning for an authority figure to take care of you and to love you. And those in power recognize this, which is why they promote lovelessness within families. They can then hook into that void of affection that you had as a child and say, don't worry, we'll take care of you, we love you, we will be your protectors. But it is an even more brutal form of exploitation than unloving parents. And until we learn to heal that wound, we will forever be livestock to those in power.